Director of the Global Health Certificate in the Duke Global Health Institute. She received her BA from Cornell University and her PhD from Indiana University in Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. She has been selected by the National Center for Science Education as a leadership fellow. She also serves on the editorial board of the journal Science Education and Civic Engagement, an international journal. Dr. Berman's work in Kenya on gender inequality, education, and HIV risk has led her to co-found an NGO called the Women's Institute for Secondary Education and Research, also known as WISER. She is going to tell us about this more, so please help me to introduce Dr. Berberman. Thank you very much. I am going to turn down the lights. I wish a little bit. They're going to be a little more than I'd like, but hopefully I can keep your attention here. That's pretty darn dark. Okay. Um, thank you, Shannon, for that invitation. And um, now that you've said the Women's Institute for Secondary Education and Research, I can just say wiser from now on. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what we've been doing. WISER is uh, started in 2006 as an NGO in Kenya. It's been an affiliate of Duke, a Duke program through the Duke Global Health Institute. And uh, as of this summer, we'll become an independent 501c3, which we're very excited about. Let's see if I can get these to automatically advance. I'll put it over here. So the vision of the NGO is to create a replicable, I can never say that word, I got to take it out of the vision, a replicable model for generating gender parity in education, health, and community leadership in the global south. And I'm going to show you, and most of you probably know, that education, health, and international development are really are inextricably combined. And its mission is to improve educational, economic, and health outcomes for girls, particularly those orphaned by AIDS, create gender allies in boys, and I think this is critical because until a man wants to marry an educated woman or a brother is proud that his sister finished secondary school, we're not going to have the momentum we'd like, and promote community-wide enhancements in health and development. So we have three main domains of action, education, health, and community development, and we're looking to develop evidence-based multidisciplinary interventions that improve each of these three areas. So I would like to introduce you to the community first. Mahuru Bay is a little fishing village and a little spit of land, you'll see it later in a satellite image, right on the Tanzania border, right on Lake Victoria. Uh, very poor community, it's about 25, 30,000, there hasn't been a good census. Um, I would normally, there's no running water, there's no sanitation. Um, I would say there's no electricity, but you could see the first power line that just came in to this downtown area. A few people have started to see electricity, um, but again, it's very expensive, so the majority of the people don't, they still use kerosene. This is downtown. Um, few cars, a lot of goats. So it's a very poor Kenyan community. The women work very hard. Traditional rural area where the women do the bulk of the labor, whether it's taking care of children or collecting firewood. Uh, this is a neighbor of mine, Mamo Chali. I'm going to come back to the idea of women having to carry firewood. I wanted you to have that image uh, and think about how long it would take her to walk around, carry that, and bring it back. To really understand this community, small, rural, undeveloped fishing village, you have to understand the culture of communities around Lake Victoria. Bring that down. So the lake is everything to people. If you want water to drink, you go to the lake. If you want to wash your clothes, you go to the lake. If you want to wash your dishes, you go to the lake. If you want to wash your little brother's uh, soiled pants from diarrhea, you go to the lake and you wash them where everyone else is getting water and washing their dishes. It is the source of Everyone calls it the blessing and the curse of Mahuru Bay because it is the only source for water for all the things I mentioned as well as any kind of irrigation for agriculture. The problem with the lake is it is also the major source of economic development in the area and that fishing is the only cash uh, economy in the area. The problem with fishing is that the men um, fish up and down around the Lake Victoria down to Tanzania, up to Uganda, and they have multiple sexual partners around the lake. This is also a naturally polygamous community, so men having multiple wives in different villages is completely accepted. And so these men end up becoming transmitters of HIV around the lake. And you have a lake effect on HIV rates throughout Kenya. 
which I, I'll show you in the next slide. There's also a continued problem. It's been well studied in all the Great Lakes in Africa of this fish for sex cultural process where um, for if women want to get into the cash commodities, what they have to do is basically have sex with the fishermen. The fishermen give them the fish. They take the fish, they go to the village, and they sell the fish, and now they have shillings. And that's one of the few ways women can get hard currency to buy shoes for their kids or pay medical bills or send their kids to school. So uh, again, th this is a really well-developed and integrated economic system that really exploits or allows HIV to be exploited and be transmitted. So if you look at HIV rates, I'm going to have to stand over here, I'm sorry. Across Kenya, first of all, the little bit on the right that's bright red is Nyanza province, and that is right on Lake Victoria. And Kenya overall has 7% HIV infection rate. Nyanza has 15%. HIV infection rate, and if you looked along sort of the lip of the lake, you would find 38% HIV infection in the fishing villages. And again, this has been replicated in Uganda and Tanzania and the other Great Lakes in Kenya, this fish for sex process. So you have a tremendous disease burden and a great number of AIDS orphans. The blue cluster of AIDS orphans you can see in the center of the country are, is Kibera, the slums in Nairobi. You can see it. Because of being in the lake area, we also have the highest, um, well, sorry, malaria rates in the country as well, um, and the highest infant mortality as well. So infant mortality is about five children not living past their first birthday for every thousand live births in the United States, and it's 150 per thousand in Nyanza province. This is a really strong indicator of poverty and lack of development, this high level of infant mortality. So you have incredibly high disease burden with, um, on children, malaria, and HIV. I'm going to have to stand right here. I originally went there to look at some of the educational challenges, particularly at adolescent girls, and found that only 5% of girls go to secondary school, and none had ever from the school district qualified for college. During the basis, uh, during a summer of um, deep ethnography research in the community, we found out that 20% of students are orphans and 10% are HIV positive by the time they're in secondary school. Again, they're involved in, in fish for sex as well as transactional sex. There was a significant amount of sexual abuse by teachers. This was really well documented and admitted to by parents, parents teachers, and students. Uh, if you want a kerosene light to study with in the evening, you have to trade a sexual favor with a teacher. There were many forced marriages in this community, um, starting 9, 10, 11 years old. Um, if a family was poor and owed another family money, they would promise their adolescent or pre-adolescent daughter as payment. And there were a lot of sexual relationships with teachers. So school was, had a lot of gender-based violence in it and was pretty predatory on young girls. These girls are incredibly ambitious. They have been told over and over that getting an education is the way out of poverty. And so they are focused on getting out of poverty and, and being successful in school. And they've had to make some really hard choices on what to do with themselves. We had someone put a note underneath the door of the hut I was staying in one night that said, should I stop having sex with the man who is paying my school fees, I, you know, I'm worried about getting AIDS. A lot of these girls admitted that they had to make friends with someone in order to stay in school. And they w did not want to get married at 12 or 14 and start having children and having their children die or end up with obstetric fistula or all the problems with early marriage and pregnancy. They wanted an education and they wanted to make something of themselves. This Ethnography study that I initially did was then followed up with a rigorous quantitative survey of 400 children, 10 to 16 years old. And we found that 5% of all these kids had symptoms of depression. 19% had considered suicide at some point in their life. And we, this was a study by a really wonderful clinical community psychologist, Dr. Eve Puffer, you'll hear about more later, who's actually involved with your Fogarty School and the Institute of Global Health, or Fogarty Scholarship. And she found that there was significant levels of trauma equivalent, they would score as post-traumatic shock on any of the measures we use in the United States in these really young adolescents. 
And the trauma was having watched a loved one die. I mean, I've told you about the HIV rate, I've told you about the malaria rate and the infant mortality. And so imagine watching your mother slowly waste away of AIDS and then your little brother die in two days of, of diarrhea and dehydration. And you're left at 14 as perhaps head of household. And you don't have a hope for the future. So there was trauma and there's also a significant level of violence in the community. Um, they had witnessed beatings or had experienced them themselves. There's a lot of violence. In the classroom in Kenya, caning is illegal, but practiced fairly routinely, certainly out in the areas where we are, far out from Nairobi and Central Valley. Shockingly, or maybe not shockingly, of these kids, 10 to 16 years old, of those that are sexually active, over 50% are having sex for money already. And when they're very clear, uh, again, these were anonymous uh, surveys about what they have sex for, well, first of all, um, they can make equivalent of about a dollar twenty-five for carrying firewood for an afternoon, which is why I showed you that picture of the woman collecting firewood. It takes two, three hours walking around. It's hard work. It's hot. You're thirsty. You can make three bucks for ten minutes of sex. And the girls would say, and "Let me just also point out that in this community, the average income for the week in the family is five dollars. So this is a huge amount of money." that you find that wealthy fisherman who just brought in a big catch, who has a little extra spare change, and you go into the bushes for 10 minutes. And the girls would say, you know, I have my regular partners. They don't interfere with my studying. I only do it on the weekend. I don't let it interfere with my chores. It was part of what they needed to do to get through life. If you ask them, what are you spending the money on? What's the impetus for this? They would say, well, I need clothing, which I'm not getting from my family and I need hygiene items. Basic hygiene, including soap, as well as sanitary pads for taking care of their menstrual flow. And I want to give you a little background on menstruation in Kenya. There's been a really well-studied link between menstruation education and HIV risk. It's been calculated that probably over a million girls in Kenya can't afford sanitary pads. These, again, are schools. This is, I think, the secondary school I first started at. There's, no, there's one pit latrine, there's no water, there's no privacy, you can't clean yourself up. So you don't go to school when you're menstruating, you stain your uniform, you get harassed, so you miss school. And you can, if you really are determined to get out of poverty and you want that education, you want to be there for that algebra test. In the school I also worked at, the girls were not allowed to meet with the teacher outside the classroom because everyone knew that's where the sexual predation would happen. But instead of stopping the teachers from doing it, they stopped the girls from getting extra office hours. The boys could go and get all the extra tutoring, but the girls couldn't. So if you miss school, you just get behind. There's also some suggestions in the literature that when girls use non-sanitary products, because they can't afford pads, they use old rags, they use leaves, they use grass, they use anything they can to block their flow so they can get to that math class, that there's a really good chance you're gonna get vaginosis or some kind of vaginal infection, and any vaginal infection dramatically increases the risk of HIV if you have unprotected sex. So these girls are feeling pretty trapped. They wanna, I'm gonna stay right here, they wanna go to school because they wanna escape poverty. But they start to menstruate, and they have no pads, no water, no bathroom, so they stay home, their grades go down, their parents start saying, what a waste of money to educate a girl, it's not worth it anymore, we're gonna marry you off. Look at you, we've sent you to school and you can't even do well. Or the girl can have sex for three or five dollars, she can get those pads, and, um, and then she can stay in school, which is what she wants to do, but now she's increased her risk of HIV by having sex with um, an older man who most likely has that cash and who might be having multiple sexual partners. Or the girl has another choice. She can try and be entrepreneurial and go to school and devise her own kind of non-sanitary products, old newspapers, in which case she can go to school, but she might have increased HIV risk from having vaginal infections if she now has unprotected sex. So you can see, the, you know, look through that straight line. She wants to go to school and, and get out of poverty. There's tremendous ambition, and they see it as their only hope, and they get trapped into either early marriages, which also increases HIV risk, or these other strategies. So 
there's a, this is a very poor community. There's bad education. There's malaria, HIV, transactional sex, trauma. It hurts everyone there, but there's an extra burden on the girls in this. Sort of bad news. We must turn it around now and say, what can we do about this? What kind of interventions and what can we learn from what other people have done? The good news is helping the lives of girls, improving lives of girls helps everyone. We could say this is a humanitarian issue, this is a human rights issue, these young women are being abused, we need to intervene for that reason. We can also say this is a really practical type of intervention that not only helps the girls but helps their surrounding community. So I'm going to give you a long list of how educating a girl helps the community that's been compiled from multiple studies done by the World Bank. Bottom line, if there's a health indicator you want to change, educate a girl. If there's an economic indicator you want to change, educate a girl. So, and I don't want to change the volume, I'll go here. The getting and keeping girls in school reduces child mortality and malnutrition, improves family health, delays the age of first marriage and all the benefits of that, lowers fertility rates, enhances women's domestic role and their political participation in society. It improves their functioning in the wage labor force, strengthens a family's survival strategies, and increases economic growth. And study after study has shown that the causation is clear. Improvement in girls' education is the cause of this increase in economic growth, not the effect. So you want to change society, educate a girl. There's been a lot of interest shown by this by major corporations and foundations. The Nike Foundation has launched the Girl Effect program, which has $100 million to start looking at the pivotal role adolescent girls, between 12 and 14 particularly, play in developing countries. I'm happy to say we're now affiliated and have received some funding from them. The Center for Global Development has had a whole series of reports on the impacts or the importance of focusing on girls, particularly a new agenda for global health, start with a girl. What role does adolescent girls' health play? The literature is starting to burgeon with new papers on looking, teasing apart these impacts here, education and vulnerability, the role of schools in protecting young women and girls from HIV in Southern Africa. They have a really nice, um, intellectual theoretical model about the different ways enhanced educational attainment can reduce HIV infection. I don't have a pointer, but I'm also particularly interested in on the far right, the socioeconomic status, because it's been shown that women that have, are, inde are economically independent are sexually independent and have autonomy over their sex lives. They get to choose their partners, the when, the where, and the what timing. So, very excited about this study in Uganda showed there's a 6.7% reduction in the risk of infection for every year spent in school. Even one more year of high school is protective. H it turns out that education is the most protective factor you can do for an adolescent girl for keeping her HIV free. A report in South Africa, keep them in school, the importance of education is a protective factor against HIV infection. And girls in this study who completed secondary school were half as likely as their peers, half as likely to be HIV positive as their peers who drop out. So you could have a dramatic impact on the health of the girl herself by keeping her in school. Harking back to that World Bank list of, of um, positive impacts, you're also have an impact on the next generation. I'm going to give up on this. The Lancet, just this fall, published a paper on increased educational attainment and its effects on child mortality in 175 different countries over a 29-year period. And they found that of the 8.2 million fewer deaths in children younger than five, they estimated that over 50% of that reduction in infant mortal child mortality could be attributed to having educated mothers. 50% of the reduction in child mortality we have done in the last 30 years is from educating girls. There's no other intervention or factor that has had anything of that scale of an effect. So people will often say, well, you're not doing health work, you're putting girls in school. And I was like, that's the best health work we can do in some of these communities. It's not the only thing we should do, but it's a critical factor. So, wiser. 
lot of theoretical background on the impact of this, a lot of huge need in this community for developing it. So I'd like to now tell you the various programs we've implemented and some of the things we have learned in the process. And go through some of our signature programs. At the heart of it all was a new secondary school for girls in this community. Remember, less than 5% had ever gone to high school in this community. We are now opening a school for 120 girls, which will be the largest number of girls to ever go to high school in this community. They're on full scholarships. They get everything down to the underwear and, yes, the sanitary pads in order to get to this school. Kenya, in theory, has free secondary education, but that means tuition is free. Boarding is not. The majority of schools are boarding schools in Kenya, as well as uniforms, books, paper, all that. We want these girls to come out and become economically independent. We also want some to go on to higher education. So we're emphasizing skills for postgraduate employment. That means computer and technology skills, as well as foreign languages. When I first went to this village, they had never, the girls had never met an educated woman. There was no female teachers anywhere in the school district. So now we have brought in highly skilled female teachers, and we brought in access to health care and health education. Again, at these boarding schools, if you get sick, they send you home to die because they don't want you to die on campus. When I first went there, there was a girl who had malaria and typhoid and had left her dormitory, not to Wiser, when I went first to the other school, and um, I asked the principal. You know, I spent a long time running around demanding answers from people before I sort of figured out how to work in the system. You know, what are you going to do if, if Mary doesn't get better? And they say, well, we send her home to, home to, if she's going to die, we send her home because we cannot have her die on campus. And that is true for many of the schools in Kenya. There's no, um, no health support. So this was after the first term. The girl, girls came in physically battered. Four of them were pregnant by their primary school teachers, uh, shy. And the transformation in their personalities to the end of the year was, I could look at Margaret forever, was just phenomenal. And I was just there two weeks ago to bring in our second group of girls. and. Again, to see the first group suddenly become peer mentors was, it, it was just a magical moment. So it's really exciting. We had zero attrition, 100% coming back for the second year, which again is, is pretty unheard of in that area. So we started a secondary school, but we were working with a primary school program district that was, didn't do a very good job and also had very high attrition in the primary school. And we did not want to do remedial work at our secondary school. So we started what we call Wiser Bridge, which is the bridge from primary to secondary. For those not familiar with uh, Kenyan educational system, primary goes through grade eight. There's no middle school. So we are now working with over 700 students. And most of these are boys. Wiser, the school is girls only. Every other program I'm going to tell you about is co-ed. And it's how we develop gender allies. It's how we get the whole community supporting our programs. So we are working with the whole school district. We now have as a, a case study. When we first went there, so we, we wanted to implement several things. First, we wanted to increase access to appropriate educational materials. Sometimes they didn't even have books. We also brought in professional um, seminars to do teacher to professional development and build capacity in the educators. We brought in external accountability by having four year, exams a year to show progress along um, throughout the year, and community engagement. Uh, when we have a Wiser Bridge ceremony to celebrate top teacher or top girl or top boy, one to 2,000 people show up for the community. It's a major event, and schools and the different chiefs in the area now compete to see which, who's going to have the top kid from their district. So we have made this a major event and changed the valuation of of education. I have had parents say, I've taken away all my daughter's chores so she can study more because she's going to be the top girl at Young Guayo next year at that particular primary school. So um, there's been a cultural shift as well. The two major uh, interventions are we extend the school day or the school week by seven hours a week, and we pay teachers for performance. It's a conditional cash transfer to teachers based on their ability to improve grades uh, for all their students. And we also then obviously need independent accountability on who's providing the test to make sure that we can see they're actually improving their teaching. And it has been incredibly well received. 
um, and as I'll show you, incredibly effective. It also has reduced absenteeism, both by students and teachers, and reduced the physical violence in the classroom because they're not eligible for this extra pay if they're involved in caning students. So we've been doing this for two years now. Prior to the intervention, 6% of girls passed the national exam. And if you don't pass, you can't go to high school. After two years of intervention, 40% of girls in the whole school district are passing the national exam. Just a phenomenal, astronomical increase that's higher than we really expected, but are totally delighted with. We've also increased the scores for boys as well. The whole school district, it, used to, it was one of the lowest in the provinces, close to being one of the lowest in the country, and the, the whole, the average for the school district has gone up by 25%. We've also increased by 50% the girls enrolled in grade eight. So girls that would have dropped out earlier because their parents had given up on them, now have the opportunity to be competitive for a scholarship to Wiser, and parents are choosing to keep their girls in school. So the number of girls um, staying in school has gone up, which again is, is very exciting. We've been recognized as a champion of quality education in Africa by, by Ashoka um, leadership, and we have a new partnership with the Nike Foundation. They really want to, um, they've given us a small grant to research the key components of the Wiser Bridge program so we can see if we can replicate it in other parts of Kenya, Africa, or other developing countries because it's been pretty effective. I think the Wiser Bridge program is partly effective because they have Wiser at the end. We've developed this educational pipeline and it's a really closed system working solely within one school district. Okay, girls are responsible for all the water consumption within their families. Normally, you put a bucket on your head and you walk down to Lake Victoria and you carry it back. Or if you happen to have a ditch or a gully near you, you can get it um, there. It's a, if you see there's a girl with a bucket, sorry, a bag of brown fluid, that's water she's gotten from the ditch that she's carrying home for her family to use for washing, cooking, whatever. They will let the sediment come out and they might even put some chlorine tablets in it. But this is a community, I said about 25,000. 5% of the community have pit latrines, meaning you know concrete slab that you squat over and you defecate into. The other 95% do open defecation. They defecate in the bushes. The rainy season comes, the feces washes into the lake, the feces washes into the ditches and the gullies, and there's tremendous typhoid and cholera in this community. So we have partnered with UNICEF WASH, Water Sanitation and Hygiene, to provide the first clean drinking water for over 5,000 people. Um, initially, it's based on the Wiser campus. <laughs> we now have, we have water treatment facilities. So we have, you know, the sedimentation, filtration, chlorination process. We, this is what comes out of the water from Lake Victoria, and then we have clean drinking water that's now passing every test for drinking. And people are drinking this on campus um, we have also developed a partnership with Development and Gardening, or DIG, a wonderful acronym, whose job is to help develop gardens um, either in urban areas or in places uh, that have nutritional needs. This is a community that has lived on cassava and maize and has not had access to lots of fruits, leafy greens, and vegetables because they don't grow in a dry area. We now have irrigation. The girls are starting gardens that's been tied into their agriculture and business studies on how to market produce. They are the change agents. They're going out and teaching their families how to um, garden. The school's becoming self-sufficient in food production. And DIG came and gave nutrition courses on, you know someone in your family's HIV positive. How do you need to balance their diet, particularly if they're on antiretrovirals, in order to make those more effective? So that's been really successful. Plus, we have beautiful gardens behind our school, which I'm excited about. This is a satellite image from GOI of Mahuru Bay sticking out into Lake Victoria. The little green house is wiser. Um, some of the other thumbtacks are some of the primary schools we're working with. With money from UNICEF WASH, we're putting up community kiosks to provide water to people, clean drinking water to um, that red, sorry, the Red Cross is the single Ministry of Health clinic, which does not have clean drinking water or electricity, just has not historically. Um, 
but we are now providing that and phase two with UNICEF is to extend the pipeline and try and provide clean drinking water to 25,000 people or the whole community through a series of developing a community water board that will manage these kiosks. People will have to pay per liter of water in order to maintain the system. I'm interested in water as a microfinance system. Instead of giving people water, sorry, instead of giving them money, give them water for irrigation um, and see if then they can grow crops and then pay us back after doing that. So how, do, how can we use water as an investment in the community? Uh, this is Dr. Eve Puffer sitting here, and you can see that the Fogarty International Clinic Research Scholars and Fellows logo just popped up. Eve was a postdoc with me for two years at the Duke Institute of Global Health, um, and then received a fellowship from Fogarty. And Eve is a trained clinical community psychologist and is looking at what kind of HIV prevention programs can we develop. There's a lot of literature that says teaching kids knowledge, teaching them ABCs of abstinence, behavior change, condoms, has really no impact on their HIV risk. What has likely to have an impact is what they see around them and what they see their parents do, what they see their ministers do, what they see the leaders in the community do, or their peers do. So this is a social ecology model where the, rather than looking at the individual's behavior and education, you look at the social networks. You look at parents and family relationships and communication structures. And so Eve has been um, in Kenya for three years. She just returned to the United States. Initially looking at the individual and family level psychosocial correlates of risk behavior among youth. This was published last fall in AIDS and Behavior. And then developing an intervention that looked again at the community level, working with families and the churches to improve community family communication strategies and how families support adolescents. A lot of the parents did not know, not surprising maybe, that their girls, their daughters were having transactional sex and that small amounts of money or buying them underwear might minimize these activities. So it involved family communication, developing family budgets, how to develop, um, how to communicate about HIV. There's a lot of evidence that the more negative parents are about sexual activity, the more likely the child is to participate in sexual activity. And so how do you develop appropriate communication strategies? So she has, in the process of doing an intervention, where the churches and parents are now talking about HIV differently. It's called Resilience Education and Skill Development for Youth and Families, the Ready Project. <laughs> Mahuru Bay is ready for getting rid of HIV, and we're really excited about that. Found a lot of mental health challenges that I reported to you earlier. A lot of non-intuitive non, um, things. Girls who spend a lot of time with their mothers are less likely to have HIV boys who spend a lot of time with their fathers are more likely to become HIV positive because they're learning traditional male roles of having sex early and often, basically. And so this, if you look at caretaker monitoring, you get incredibly different role, uh, answers when you disaggregate it by gender. Okay. I told you about this challenge before of girls wanting to get out of poverty and um, getting trapped in many areas. We've been trying to minimize this by having a sanitary pad partnership with Johnson & Johnson. Um, we've provided enough pads. You've never seen girls so happy. You know, when you go buy pads here, you're like, oh, the orange juice, the stick of butter, and you know, some stay free. Like, I just, that's all I came for, the stick of butter and the orange juice. And the girls, they go swinging it down the street. I got pads. You've never seen people so happy. This was not posed. They just clutch them and cuddle them. Um, save over 15,000 school days for girls in Mahuru Bay. Um, we initially gave the disposables. Johnson Johnson's now giving us these year-long packets that have pads, three different kinds of, you know, layers for different flow levels, soap and water and underwear and information on how to take care of them. And I will have a graduate student this summer working on does the provision of pads actually impact transactional sex and perhaps reduce um, HIV risk via reducing vaginal infections, which we're trying to see. We're actually going to look at this at three different levels. One is the HIV risk vaginal infections, one on school attendance, and the third is going to be on self-esteem and self of ability to, to feel clean, to feel powerful, to, to walk through life without worrying about what your body's doing. And I do go fast. 
Um, there is a single Ministry of Health clinic, and uh, there is a clinical director. I've had students working with him for a while, going through his records. This is a brief summary of vaccination rates in the community. And as you can see, they're pretty darn bad. If you look at the whole schedule of vaccines a child should get before they're five, only 8% of the kids in the community are fully immunized. Um, kids there die of measles. Only 30% of kids finish their measles vaccines, that schedule. So again, this summer, he's been asking us to do this for a while and finally getting the staff people to do it this summer to identify the barriers to childhood vaccination, other geographic uh, barriers, we're gonna GPS map the catchment area. Um, is it the education and knowledge about the fact that you don't need one measles vaccine, you need boosters? Is it the age of the mother? Is it the number of the siblings? One issue he, the clinical director keeps bringing up is he thinks that babies get vaccinated and run slight fevers and the mothers say the vaccine made them sick and refuse to take them back again for another shot. And so that's an obvious opportunity for intervention about education, about what is an appropriate response to a vaccine. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity to really work with that clinic to improve their functioning within the community. And yeah, that was a request for help from some of you sometimes. A lot of opportunities for projects. Also, again, there's, this is the peninsula, the Little Red Cross is the Ministry of Health Clinic. There's a lot of geographic, you know, that far out of the peninsula you can't even see is a good five hour walk away. How often do people there make it to the Ministry of Health Clinic? If you walk, go south towards Tanzania, you basically climb up a mountain. You can't drive up there. I've only been up there on the back of a motorcycle. How often do people there walk down to the Ministry of Health Clinic? So how often, how can we improve the reach throughout their catchment area? And there's several private clinics of varying quality and varying training. And what factors do people use when they decide where to go? Is it strictly geography? Do they go to the closest place? Or do different clinics have different reputations? And that's how people are deciding where to get their health care services. So there's a lot of opportunities to try and work to improve health care in this area. So I told you we had three different domains. Um, and Wiser's trying to unite them and develop interventions that overlap. We've been very fortunate in developing a whole series of partnerships with UNICEF Wash and Nike and Fogarty, Johnson & Johnson and DIG. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to develop this. We certainly don't have the capacity to serve all the needs of the community. There's been a lot of people involved with this. I particularly want to thank the, uh, Rose Odiambo, who's from this village and was the only girl to go to college from this village. She did it by running away from a forced marriage at 16 and living in the slums of Nairobi and fortunately being able to continue her education because she's brilliant. But um, we need to create other opportunities, so that's not the only strategy a girl has for coming successful. And I'm gonna stop and say thank you and leave some time for questions. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that you were, you know, recruited uh, female teachers and leaders to the time and you were more like worried about them if they were from the neighboring communities or where they came from. Uh, they're all Kenyan. Um, first of all, we recruited an absolutely phenomenal principal, and we just uh, really lucked out in that there was a, a top notch principal from a premier private school in Nairobi who happened to come from the next village over and was looking forward to retirement and an exciting new project. So she came in. She was extremely well connected. She was on Kenya's National Advisory Board for um, generating the policy on free secondary education. We also just advertised nationally. Um, we, not everyone wants to live where we are. Um, we are putting in the, with that UNICEF water, uh, toilets and showers, and trying to create a different housing environment than is available in the neighborhood for people who have lived in big cities and um, so that they're comfortable living out there. Uh, we've actually had no trouble recruiting and we have a really great group when I was just there. We just hired three new teachers as we're expanding our students and they have all are married and they all have their kids out there. I worry about the educational opportunities for our teachers' students, like where are they going to go to school? Um, 
but uh, it's really growing as a community right now. We pay fairly well because we want happy teachers. We do a lot of professional development. The first cohort of teachers were brought to the United States for a month for professional development and team building. So, and we're putting in a computer center for a lot of international linkages. So it's a, it's a, it, it's a good place to work in many ways. It's just the back of beyond. There's another question here, yeah. We can't. Um, you know, we had, two years ago we had the problem and that not enough girls were passing the exam, so we had we got a permission from the Ministry of Education to take girls who had failed in as case studies to show that they could do well and they're astronomical. They're doing great. Um, now we have too many. At one level, that's great. If they can be competitive to other schools in Kenya that get scholarships, that's wonderful. We now have to track those longitudinally to see what happens. Because, you know, there's a phrase in Kenya, uh, in parts of Africa called educational wastage. You invest in someone and they get an education and nothing comes of it. And we want to see, hopefully that is not happening. Maybe they'll end up at Alliance or one of the other nice, uh, if not a national school, maybe a provincial school. So we're hoping to float everyone's boat. We know we're not only going to take 30 girls a year until we're up to 120. We also give scholarship to the top boys. Again, that's part of our community buy-in. Um, so not 30, but the top three boys get free scholarships to anywhere in country they can get accepted. So we're going to be up to eventually 12 a year once we have three per year after the four years of high school. Um, which is again, part of being a good neighbor and a good partner with the whole community. But, you know, a lot of boys are passing and we're hoping they're just going to be more competitive. I, I could back this up and say Kenya needs a lot more, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the capacity for all the smart people they have. I mean. 200,000 kids graduate from high school every year in Kenya. 50,000 pass the national exam. That tells you how bad the national exam is or the education is, because you shouldn't throw away three quarters of the kids that you transfer. Out of the 50,000 that graduate, there's only room in colleges for 10,000. The, the class capacity for the nation of Kenya is 10,000 in public schools. There's another 40,000 that are great, smart, made it through the system and have nowhere to go. Um, so there's, it's a huge issue. There's a lot of unemployed, brilliant, educated people in Kenya that we have to think about of where our wiser girls going to land. But right, you know, we're building the pipeline piece by piece. There were a whole bunch of other questions over there. Yeah. What, what is the yearly cost of educating one young woman at Wiser? Um, it's about four thousand dollars. At when we're at full capacity, it'll be about thirty-five hundred dollars a year, three thousand five hundred a year which could be really high or really low, depending what perspective you're looking at. We have to, um, there's some great other models in Kenya. Sturehe High School is a public-private partnership where it's a private school, but the Kenyan government provides all the teachers. Problem with that is you can't fire a teacher for sexually harassing a girl easily in Kenya, and we want to be able to have control over teacher behavior, so we have to pay all our own teachers. So um, it's, 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 it's a private school, it's expensive. Yeah. That was sort of my question. It seems like the, one of the biggest risk factors for HIV is transactional sex. So is there any legal ramification or is there any cultural norm? Or It seems like it's a, a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. Is there any ramification for someone who's abusing a child? First, let me say, everything I told you about Smaharube, Kenya is a diverse and complex place with many cultures. Nairobi is incredibly different, Nakuru, Kasumu, Mombasa, any of the major cities, the Central Valley, very different cultures. There's also over 50 different tribal cultures in Kenya. What I'm talking about is rural, mostly uneducated, Luo tribal area. So I don't want to generalize. Um, there is the equivalent of the like, Women's Legal Defense Fund in Kenya that I've interacted with around other girls that were forcibly raped by teachers. But in this community, it's a cultural norm. It's considered a perk. Teachers who are sent there by the Kenyan Teacher Service Commission do not want to be there. They're, under, they're poorly trained, they're poorly paid, they're infrequently paid. One of the only perks of the job is being able to have sex with students. Um, I was telling people earlier, before I sort of learned how to work within the system, I would run around irate about everything. And a girl was an orphan and was having sex with someone, and she said, I really don't want to, but it's the only way I can stay in school. I went to the principal and he was like, yeah, 
there's a community development fund that, the, that is there just to help orphans and things like that, but she'll have to have sex with at least one or two of the chiefs before they'll recommend her to the community development fund for money. So there, it's completely in a social norm that um, we're working to break within the Wiser Bridge program right now. Our first year was if you came, you can't participate. And this year it's gonna be if you sexually abuse a girl, you can't participate. Um, or even the whole school might be kicked out of the program, which would be tremendous peer pressure and pressure from the principal to regulate teacher behavior. Because even though we're only paying 300 shillings an hour, um, teachers are re-roofing and putting on additions. That's a huge amount of money there. So it's really significant. Yes, please. Yeah, sustainability, it's, it's the big question. So we can't charge fees of these girls or we wouldn't be having them. Another model was to have 30% pay, fee paying students from across Kenya. Wouldn't it be wonderful to attract a diverse audience to help again get rid of tribal problems, bring young leaders together from across country. That some of our donors did not like because we want, we want to work within a closed system of one school district and how do we change the culture in one school district right i mean right now it's all based on donations um, there's potential to eventually develop some kind of enterprise on campus right now i said we've greatly reduced our costs with the garden there's the potential for you know chickens bees other things that will um, help fund it i think there's always going to have to be donors involved um, but it's a model Wiser Bridge is an easy replicable model, though that's the primary school program. The cost is a lot lower. But I think they sort of have to go hand in hand. But to show that in a community that has historically never produced an educated, successful girl, how much do you have to do to get her there? It's a challenge. If you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, how did I pick it? It picked me. I'm a total accidental activist. I went to Kenya um, with the National Science Foundation grant to help improve science education. And back when President Moy declared AIDS a national disaster, he put a mandate that all universities would develop a course on HIV AIDS for a general audience. There's no history of liberal arts education in Kenya. The idea that you would teach science to non-science students was a completely novel idea. Um, and it takes different strategies and different teaching styles. I went in as a, got a grant and was in a, as a consultant. I've worked also in, in Uganda and South Africa doing the same type of thing of um, how do you create AIDS literacy in, in sometimes even in an illiterate population? How do you get them to talk about it in a way that they understand or understand treatment literacy if they're on stuff? So anyway, I went in and was working at a university in, in Egerton University and my colleague Rose Odiambo is from this village. So she was my colleague on the grant. I met her at an international science ed meeting funded by USAID and NSF to try and build partnerships to help develop AIDS education. And she said, come see where I grew up. Come home and meet my mom. I spend more time with her mom than she does now. I tease her about that all the time. Because she's, you know, because I, but um, she said, come see my village. Come talk to the girls. Come see the one high school. Let's go try and rally the girls. And after a couple years of staying up late at night, hearing the girls cry and talk about their problems, Telling them to work harder is just not going to do it. You know, they're working as hard as they can, but they have no opportunities except selling themselves to get a good grade. This is true throughout Kenya. One of the, a sadly funny story. In at Rose's University at Egerton, so many girls were getting good grades by having sex with professors. They were calling it STDs, sexually transmitted degrees. And the boys were complaining that it was unfair that the girls had this opportunity to get better grades than they did. And so the boys protested and tried to shut down the sexual harassment because they were academically disadvantaged. 
So that was an interesting, interesting way that it came about. Um, so going back to other villages, um, what we're seeing mostly is the educational part. We have, in order to get into Wiser, when you take a low resource setting and you plump a big fat resource in the middle, people get really creative. Getting a full scholarship to Wiser is a big resource. To get into Wiser, you have to go through our primary school bridge program. We have people moving to the area to put their kids in the primary school program. A negative consequence of Wiser Bridge is the school districts expanding too rapidly and class size is going up because people are coming to get into Wiser Bridge. We have kids who are in high school and are dropping out and going back to primary school to go through our program to become eligible for Wiser. So the prize is so big that we're seeing a lot of um, actions that are not to those people's best interests. And that has led to a really interesting opportunity to talk with communities, have really clear transparency about who can and cannot get in and why we have these different things. Do not waste your child's time. We've had children pulled out of schools in Nairobi and brought back. And they ace all the tests because they're coming from a better educational system, but that's not what we're trying to do. We could build a school and take the best girls from across Kenya. And people have done that and it's a great thing. We're trying to see what can you do in a poor school district where the smart girls don't you don't have the flight and they never get seen again. They're there in the community, they're home on vacation, they're talking to their siblings about what they're learning and how valuable it is. And so we're trying to keep it a closed system. It's hard. Just ask me like four different things. Uh, so all, all important about community ownership. Community ownership. Right, right. So for Wiser Bridge, um, the head teachers at all the schools, we have one um, American person running Wiser Bridge, and then she works with the head teachers of all the schools. Uh, and they're working, e and now they're going to have a, a whole series. This just came out in the last set rounds of, of acceptances, which happened in January that we found out that people were doing things like this. Um, so uh, who, 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 hire, who accepts the girls? Um, we have a written application and essays and interviews, which nothing else, in Kenya it's usually your score. You get your score, you get picked. Um, they have to have, inter because we know all the teachers who work with them, we get letters from them all. Um, it's the Ken the, this year it was the Kenyan, the, the, the Kenyan teachers picked them all. Um, there was only one Mzungu on the board um, who was the Wiser Bridge director. So it's the teachers at Wiser who are going to be teaching these girls, read them all and interviewed them all, and the headmistress, the Kenyan headmistress did that all, um, which is as it should be. Um, there is a local advisory board for general product projects, then specific ones like there's a community water board now. We have a national board for the NGO overall and what direction we're trying to go to. There's, I think, there's three Americans involved. Yes, please. I know you talked about uh, giving scholarship to the uh, male students from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you have like, some kind of program that uh, teaches the men uh, that tries to educate them, not just about education or going to school, but some way of trying to uh, teach them on For gender relations. Um, so we do not, we currently lack our own HIV education program in the public school system. The public schools use the Kenyan National HIV AIDS program. We have data that suggests that it is not implemented well. The teachers don't feel well trained and capable of implementing it. And in some cases, it actually leads to enhanced sexual activity. I think there's a huge need for that. Um, for the boys that go off through to uh, high school, we are trying to build a cohort. Now we have six, because we have gave three last year, three this year. The school's only been working for two years. Um, and they, when they come back on school vacations, we are trying to run programs with a support, build a support group for them as the first person from their community to really go off and try and be successful. 
Um, and that's all run by our Wiser Bridge director. As far as sort of changing general behavior in adolescence, um, we for several years had a pretty successful program. We called, I get a little tired of Wiser, someone else, you know, Camp Wiser, you know, Wiser, you know, learn Wiser, live Wiser, be Wiser. We had a Camp Wiser where it was a boarding camp for 40 adolescents, 40 high school kids in Kenya, 20 boys, 20 girls, and they did, um, Adolescent health, which is basically HIV and reproductive health. They did gender and everyday life in Kenya, where they looked at gender values and how they're changing. Kenya's having a really active dialogue right now on, on, a, on a human, on an equal rights amendment in their constitution. And the last one was on leadership. And we really want to build gender allies. We want boys to learn to listen when girls speak, to feel that girls ha can have authority. So we had basically a leadership camp, again, this residential camp, where they had to work together to do problem solving in gender ed, you know, co-ed groups. Um, and that really seemed to have a lot of impact on, on boys who had only seen girls as water carriers and people who ate after they were done eating and, and weren't really part of their lives. So we hope to continue those, those summer camps.